lying down the whole time though that's just what's gonna happen are you lying on your bed right now yes it's luxurious where, wait where are you you I'm left in, the monastery yeah i'm just in a house now in berkeley it's great <laughs> better than a yeah. monastery i have more free time now which is nice oh my god <sighs> It's so good. I'm still really bad at using it, but I just appreciate that it's there at least, you know. Wait, you you appreciate that what's there? The free time. It's nice. You know? Uh yes. In the monastery I had three hours a day and that's just what didn't feel like enough after a while. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to do more stuff than I had time. Mm -hmm. And now I have time. Okay. Hey people. It's it's uh Colin and uh and QC, QC, do you want to introduce yourself to the good people here? Look at the people. No, introduce yourself. Introduce myself. Okay. Hi, what's up? I'm Chow Chu. I shit post on Twitter. And uh, I was in a monastery for three months, and now I'm not. I don't know. What else, uh, what else should I say about myself? If that's all you want to say. That's great. All right, cool. <laughs> your your energy is very your energy's very chill right now. Yeah, I mean, like, I just, just you, got out of the shower. Did, just like... Do you yeah. feel chill? I feel chill right now, yeah. I feel chill right now. I was feeling anxious earlier today, mostly like kind of buzzy. But uh, the shower has a way of melting it all, melting at least half of it away, you know? Uh, mm. Mm hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, <sighs> hmm. Okay, so. We, we have a list of things that we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, and we can get to them in any in any way that we want it this doesn't have to be a linear yes. thing it, it uh no doubt it, it will not be a linear thing i'm sure um but we have some convergence of interests and ideas and uh um i don't know like what started off as just kind of a throwaway joke tweet um has kind of spawned this this yeah. conversation it's great um <laughs> Yeah, and and it's and it's this idea of uh, and it's this idea of building a second gut, and I'm curious just when you hear that, like what what is that what does that even mean to you? Man, so it was surprisingly evocative, and I worry that like people aren't going to get it unless they have a bunch of. Hang on, I'm just trying to figure out. I'm holding an iPad right now for this for the video. Uh, you know, so of course to to explain the reference to to our listeners who apparently exist. Uh, there's this guy, Tiago Forte, on Twitter, and he does this whole course, I guess, called Building a Second Brain uh, that's all about, like, using uh, various... I don't actually know what it's about. What I think it's about is using tools like Evernote and Notion and stuff like that to, like, augment your sort of natural, uh, natural intelligence. Uh, and hence, building a second gut... Uh, one might one might take this to be an evocative metaphor about using uh, something some other kind of external tool to augment one's natural intuitions. Uh, so instead of listening to your first gut to be like, hey, maybe I should do something really stupid right now, you can listen to like people on Twitter who are like, hey, maybe you should do something really stupid right now. <laughs> and I find that I find that image just very evocative. I'm like, oh yeah, what would a second gut look like? What would it look like to have like an external source of like weird intuitions and stray feelings and like un and like illegible uh like impulses like that's just a fun I, it amuses me a lot as a as a as an image so that's what i get out of it and uh, yeah. i'm curious yeah like so, like what like what does it look like to have a a, a meta awareness on your your intuition mm. um like well actually somebody brought up a good point i um may have been heather watts she said uh that like people need to get in touch with their first gut mm -hmm. first like a lot of people aren't even in touch with with that and th this to me is like a lot of a, a lot of the the stuff that i'm thinking about with embodiment is mm -hmm. is basically just like how do you, how do you increase your perceptual capacity mm -hmm. um to allow in more information from different different sources different parts of yourself yeah um yeah so you're so you're coming out of a a monastic environment you were there for three months three yeah. months three months yeah 
Okay. It was a weird, it was a weird thing. And what are so, yeah. Well, how was it weird? Well, I mean, uh, sort of a long, I mean, the main, the main, the thing I had in mind as I was saying that was that it was very weird to like learn about the pandemic and stuff while I was in a monastery, you know, I was like reading in my spare time on Twitter about it in February and getting increasingly worried, increasingly worried and being like, whoa, I wish I had more time to think about this and look this up, but I don't. And like, there was this suddenly very large tension that I hadn't really been experiencing before, but that point between like, oh man, I like I have strong impulses to just like drop all this monastery stuff right now and just go f- hard on like soaking up virus news and I couldn't. Uh, and that was very frustrating. And it was weird to be in that position where I f- like I had made a commitment that precluded my ability to do that. Uh, and then we like locked it. Because you had to cook and because you had to like, cook and clean. And yeah, meditate. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, that got very frustrating. And then the lockdown happened and I was like, oh, fuck, it's like really happening. Like I might be stuck here for a while. And then uh, and then one of us got symptoms and I was like, oh, fuck, like, this could get really, really serious. Uh, this was this happened during our uh, our March retreat, and so we got to like meditate on the possibility that we were gonna, you know, die. And that was of course a very remote possibility, but it was still just very alive. Suddenly, it was like okay, we are in the middle of a of a week long silent retreat, and we've just learned that one of us has symptoms, has like a fever and like aches, and then we all just got to like not escape that fact at all like we all had to just sit with that and be like oh (sighs) okay i guess we're all just gonna meditate with that in the background now and we started wearing masks and shit so now we were like a bunch of monks trying to meditate together but we're all wearing masks and like watching each other wear masks and it got like very very intense (laughs) for me anyway yeah Yeah. oh it sounds intense What, what was like the um uh, what, what's the culture of, of that particular monastery? So I, I know a little bit about the monastic academy and it seems to be like, um, uh, it, like integrating a bunch of different meditation styles and backgrounds. And it, it isn't like a Zen monastery. Yeah. Like the, it's sort of an amalgamation of different things. So yeah. what, what, what type of person does that draw? You know, I don't, no, I mean the oak in particular, the the particular uh, the branch that's here in the Bay Area, is uh, trying on purpose to draw like people who work in tech, people who work in AI, and so forth as part of this like hoping to help them like go down the path enough in order to, for example. St- have thoughts like oh shit like ai risk maybe is real and maybe i should be worried about it and maybe i shouldn't just like spend my whole career trying to make artificial intelligence more powerful without worrying about whether that would be a good idea <laughs> and mm. uh so that's a very specific uh crowd to target and it's much more specific than say vermont which targets a broader like vermont has traditionally been more focused on like uh, stuff like climate change and like nuclear war. So they get certain kind of people who are like very like worried about these things that are like, yeah, that we have to like reform. We have to like, uh, you know, re uh, I don't know what the word escapes me at the moment, like restructure society to like better handle all of the terrible things that are happening and that are going to happen. Uh, And I don't even know that I can generalize about, what kind of people are drawn to Vermont? Like it's a pretty diverse group of people in my experience. Um, yeah. And do you have more specific questions? Yeah. Well, one, one that's coming up is, is you, so you used to be, I don't know if you used to work in AI specifically, but you were going hard and in, in the math route, like down the math path. Yeah. Yeah. The math path. And, yeah, that's right. And, uh, and I'm curious, I'm curious to hear about like, um, especially if that's the type of aesthetic or, or those are the sorts of people that the Bay area are, are calling in. I wonder if you feel like, um, 
like people that are working on these existential risks as it relates to AI specifically, like, do you feel like a kinship with these people or are you like post, are you like post math post, like (laughs) that part of your brain entirely? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a chance for me to talk about a part of my background that I don't normally talk about on Twitter, which is that like before, so a rough summary of the last eight years or so of my life was that I was a math grad student and, uh, at UC Berkeley, and I was very involved in the in the Bay Area rationalist community. Like I was hanging out with them a lot. I was going to CIFAR workshops. CIFAR is the Center for Applied Rationality. It's like a pretty like a big focal point organization in the whole rationality community sphere. Mm-hmm. And I was like spending a lot of time around people at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, and I like, worked there briefly twice. Um, worked is a is a strong word, but <laughs> I was employed there. Let's say briefly twice what were you doing if not working well i was like reading and then tweeting attempting attempting, i wasn't i wasn't even on twitter at the time i was like attempting to work and mostly failing it's it's my most honest description of that period but so i was like very uh i've i've been like in pretty deep in this community is what i'm trying to communicate and like was at various points seriously considering working on AI risk as like my professional thing, like, oh, maybe I should work for Miri and like do this. Like I, I'm both like very mathematically skilled and like very worried about this thing and maybe it would make sense. And so this, this is a, this is a, that's something that I've been considering on and off. And then sort of the second half of the story is I like did realize that I was really fucking miserable and just like sad and lonely and depressed all the time and decided to like go hard on trying to figure out what to do about that. And then like went really hard on like uh, practices like circling and genlin focusing and just like trying to get a handle on what sorts of things feelings and emotions were and like what even was going on with that and then cried a lot and rediscovered my soul is how I might put it. It was just like holy crap, like how did you discover oh, crying? It was like a thing. Who 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 like broke the seal for you? So there is this guy, I, this I have written about on Twitter. There was a guy, Pete Michaud, who was uh, facilitating a circle for me. So a circle is like very briefly just uh, this kind of interpersonal relational practice where you're with a group of people and you basically just talk about what's coming up, how you're feeling in the moment. You're like, okay, right now I'm feeling scared and nervous and I'm like worried that one of you is gonna judge me and back sort of things along those lines. And then someone else will respond with like, oh, hearing that I'm feeling like also kind of scared and nervous and like or like oh i'm angry at you like how dare you be scared and nervous this is <laughs> and then people just go back and forth it's, it's crazy it, it's i learned a lot from that period of my life so there was one of these things happening and i had gotten really mad at somebody in the circle i was just like um really really triggered by something and um this and the facilitator pete took me aside. They had to split the circle in half. There was a half that was focused on me and a half that was focused on the person I got really mad because they also got really, it's a whole thing. Uh, so I would, he took me aside and um, I don't, I don't know how to say it other than like, he, he like, he like took me by the shoulder and he like looked at me with eyes full of love. And I think this was quite possibly the first time this had ever happened to me with a dude. Like this, pretty sure this was the first time a man had ever done that. And it just is he like father? Me. Is he like father figure age? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like ten years older than me. And afterwards, this pre experience, I was like, I want him to be my dad, <laughs> like quite explicitly. Mm-hmm. So he just looked at me with love in his eyes. That was the only way I could describe it. And I just cracked open. Like I found out what that meant. You know, people use this phrase like my heart was cracked open. Like my heart was cracked open, and I just sobbed, just harder than I'd ever sobbed in my entire life. And I cried like for maybe 10 minutes, which at the time was the longest I'd ever cried continuously. Uh, And it it felt really long. I was like, holy crap, I didn't know I could do this. Like, what the fuck? And just my whole world changed after that. Like my experience of existing in a body just changed after, after crying for that long. Like I felt more sensitive to everything. I felt like raw i learned what raw meant i was like oh this is what raw means this is what people mean when they say they feel raw i feel raw right now and like when people said things i felt them like someone would say something with some emotional charge behind it and then i would just feel it 
directly. And this was a revelation for me. I like, didn't know that was possible. <laughs> it was the first time that I remember experiencing that. I was like, holy crap, I can feel other people's emotions when they speak. Hmm. What the fuck this is like? Wait, so, so was it mostly your heart that was open or did you feel other did you feel like activation in other parts of your body too i think at the time i wasn't sensitive enough to notice anything going on aside from my heart like my heart felt very different it mm -hmm. was super raw like i like it was a kind of feeling that i'd only ever previously felt in like romantic relationships except that there was nothing romantic going on i was just like really really opened up and it was crazy. Like I just hadn't known that was possible. That, that single cry just completely changed the, the, like the trajectory of my life. Like the, the stuff I did in response to that, like led to me leaving grad school, led to me leaving the rationality community. Uh, and now I'm like shit posting about my feelings on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I consider it to be a big upgrade personally. Okay. I like this. I, I, I like this format that's emerged. So I think there is something to toggling back and forth between uh, story mm. and sort of talking about past experience and then coming back to the frame, which is building a second gut. Yeah. So, so, so what you were just talking about activated some things for me. So nice. it seems like um, this seal that was cracked, this ability to cry and start to experience your emotional body mm. is a prerequisite for having a clear um like a clear line of sight to your gut or your your intuition because because intuition i feel like can be um i don't know that it's always sort of naturally clear and clean like there are things that clog it up mm, yeah um you know like emotions are all kinds of emotions are stored in your body mm. um that can be connected to different narratives and stories about yourself and your position in the world mm -hmm. and in order to have a clear access to that intuition, like sort of clearing it out and resetting. And um, yeah, just like being able to um, see the difference between a, like a calcified belief or narrative about yourself and then what like a deeper intuition is trying to communicate to you. Yeah. How, does any of that hit, land with you? Yeah, totally. There's the, uh, the experience that I had of trying to work through all of this stuff of like, whoa, what is the deal with my feelings and my intuitions and how do I get them back? Like for me, there was this very visceral bodily progression of like, somehow I felt like I started out up here, right? Like I started out in my head uh, and that there was at every point, like a kind of barrier between wherever I was and the rest of my body. Like it started out here and then it this experience I'm talking about with the crying, like opened up my chest such that I was able to like descend down. I was like, okay, now I'm here. And when that happened after a while, it became clear that there was like another barrier. There was like a barrier between my chest and my, and my guts. And I like, I talked about this like a lot with people. Uh, there was a, there, I had like, I, you know, I, I was doing like various kinds of gently focusing and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, it's like, there's this murky, op opaque, like wall, it's like a, like an aquarium, like a giant aquarium glass wall. And I can see like giant, murky, terrible shapes behind the wall, but I don't actually know what's beyond the wall. And I'm super scared of the wall. And I'm super scared that it's gonna like break. And then all of these like horrifying monsters that are past the wall are going to like come and overwhelm me. And then that happened uh, later, it took a while. And it was like I, somehow this this second barrier between my chest and my stomach like broke at some later point. And then I felt a bunch of stuff that had been kind of trapped in my guts and it was excruciatingly painful. I don't remember the details anymore, but I just remember it being extremely, extremely painful. It was just like a lot of like years worth of, of just pain and trauma and grief and God knows what else just like it had just been that my my experience of it was that it was like trapped in my guts the whole time and then i was finally able to access it and let it some of it out and that like the more of that stuff i did it's exactly as you say like the intuitions can be like blocked by all sorts of emotional stuff and my experience has consistently been 
that some one way or another, the more I can keep myself kind of emotionally clear, like the more I can sort of clear out blockages and clear out like, uh, you know, stuck emotional energy to the extent that that is a meaningful thing to talk about, uh, then the clearer I have, the more I have clear access to, uh, yeah, one might call intuitions, just like senses of like, oh, this is, oh, this is like what I should be paying attention to. Like, oh, this is what I should be doing. And like, oh, wait, there was this thing that I had been, there was this like other thing that I had been kind of stuck in. And now I just am not stuck in that thing anymore. Now I can do something else and all sorts of, this is all very vague, unfortunately, but hopefully at least you have a sense of, of what I mean since you brought it up. Yeah, um, I, I'm curious about the, um your relationship to your intuition or your gut um, mm. in the monastic setting mm. because you're, you know, because you're like doing these daily practices, you're establishing a, a routine that, you know, one would assume is designed to cultivate a, a deeper relationship to your, to, to your um, like higher channels or your intuition. And um, I'm curious, like what that, what that experience is like for you. Yeah. So we, I'll say one more thing because there's like, I spent three, four months in a monastery as well. And there's the idea, like I had an idea of what it was like before I went there. Mm -hmm. And then my experience in the actual thing was completely different than the projections I had before. But yeah. even being outside of a monastic setting for, you know, almost two years now, um, I have what that experience was like, but, um, I also still like when I hear about people in monastic settings, the projections of what it's like sort of come back too. Mm -hmm. it, it's like being a monk, like it's, a, it's so easy to, um, to like put it on a pedestal, at least for, uh, at least for me, like my personality disposition sort of valorizes that mm -hmm. path. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know what was what like what was your experience with relating to your maybe it's this relating to, to your intuition and then also you the the difference between the projections you had or stories you had about what it was like beforehand versus the actual thing. Hmm. Ooh, yeah, that's that's meaty. Let me see what I got. So So maybe I'll start with this. There was a, so the part of the way the, the monastery is structured is that uh, we have a sort of normal schedule that happens most of the time that involves like some meditation in the morning and some meditation in the evening. And then in the middle is like cooking and cleaning and various other kinds of responsibility. That's called the, it's the responsibility schedule is what it's called. And then every one week of every month, there's a, there's a week of silent retreat. That's the awakening schedule. And that schedule involves a lot more meditating. It's like eight or 10 hours a day of meditating. Um, and there's no responsibility periods. There's just, uh, except for cooking. It's like somebody still has to cook. But so there's there's meditation and there's cooking and there's exercise and just a lot more meditation. Um, so I got, I got a lot out of the retreats that we did, the awakening periods. And in the first retreat, which was in January, uh, the main thing that came up for me was that uh, basically the whole retreat, I had been dealing with this huge, very painful uh, muscle tension. And I think my shoulders, I want to say it was my shoulders, also my neck sometimes, that would only happen when I was meditating. Uh, and that would stop once I stopped meditating, I think. And I was trying to like use a bunch of other of my other stuff on it. I was trying to like do genuine focusing and bioemotive and various things on this tension. It's just like, what is it? Like, there's like, there's like some part of me that wants something. There's like some kind of conflict, you know, like what, what's up with that? And the, the sort of the, the best answer I got to that question, which I don't entirely think is the complete answer, but the best answer I got was that there was this, um, kind of child part in an internal family systems sense that was really angry and unhappy that I was at the monastery. He was like, what the fuck, man? Why do you keep making us do this? Don't make us do this. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be meditating. I don't want to stick to the schedule. Like, 
you like ignored me when you made this decision to come here. Like you just sort of didn't pay any attention to me or like care about me at all. And he was so angry. And there was a moment where I was, I was trying to like, uh, I don't know how to describe this sort of sense that I was talking to him, but I was like trying to like find words that were the words that he would say. And those words were like coming into my experience somehow. Um, there was a moment where he said something like, you're ignoring me just like our parents ignored me. And I stopped. I had to just stop meditating when that happened. I was like, fuck, that is one accusation. Fuck this, fuck I this. Take, that's an accusation I take very seriously. <laughs> and so the only thing I could do for the rest of the retreat that felt good at all was to do do nothing meditation, which is like, is what it sounds like. You just try to not do anything. <laughs> it's very, it's fun. Uh, but anything else felt like it was exerting like too much force. Anything else felt like I would be like forcing myself in a way that a part of me was very vocally against. And it was just like refusing to let me do. So I was like, all right, I guess let's stop doing that. And I'm sorry. And I apologized, you know, I apologized to this little child part. Uh, so that was, mm. that was sort of one. Uh, that was when it first became clear to me that I had like, kind of i don't know how to describe this sort of rushed through to this, the decision to go there like this was not a well-considered decision this was a spur of the moment like fuck it i'm gonna go to a monastery what else am i gonna do um uh, and i'm not i don't necessarily regret it but um like one of the one of the main reasons i wanted to go was because i wanted an opportunity to work through a bunch of stuff including stuff about like decision making and like how to make how to like deal with structure and authority and all these other things which came up and um so i got to work through this thing of like oh wow yeah the way i made this decision was like very sloppy and haphazard and like i i didn't like get i didn't like check in with many parts of myself when i made this decision you know i sort of just like strong armed myself into doing this um which is a familiar pattern for me i've like done stuff along those lines a lot a lot of kind of internal force uh, exerting a lot of internal force in order to do things and it's still something I struggle a lot with like you know there's there's mm -hmm. it's easy to fall into this this cycle of like going through periods of using a lot of force on yourself like oh, I have to do this I have to do this I have to do that and then just getting burnt out because it doesn't really it's not sustainable you know like at, at some point some part of you just rebels mm -hmm. against that whole structure this is my experience anyway of like no fuck this i'm not gonna do this anymore and then you're burnt out and then you're like well i guess i have no motivation to do anything anymore i guess i'm gonna stay at home mm -hmm. and watch netflix mm -hmm. or whatever uh, yeah that's that's so interesting so um how do how do we square this idea of have like having different parts of ourselves different voices I mean, we're all like totally schizo like no one no one's like a unified egoic no one has like a unified ego like it's that's a fucking illusion um but so so like we, we're all schizos and uh and then there's also this concept of um non-doing like the wu way um it that's taught in things like alexander technique where it's just that that force that you're pointing to is um is sort of antithetical to moving to to a, a more sort of optimal optimal way of being, mm. but how do you square this idea of of non doing with all of the parts? Like, is it just a matter of like being able to like field all of the the voices and see what sort of naturally settles when all the parts of yourself are like free to express what they need to? Do, do you just like have a more sort of clear picture when you hear more information? Yeah, that's a good question. I have a lot, a lot of things come up for me in response to this, and I'm trying to like sort through them all. Mm -hmm. I could say like five to, I don't know, that, that, that's a guess. I don't know. I don't know that there, I could say it more than one thing in response okay. to this. Um, so, so one thing I'll say is that I think a lot of, if not all of what causes this like partsness in practice like the reason people have all these parts is because of trauma broadly speaking like an in internal family systems is moderately explicit about this they're like yeah you know the way parts work is that you something terrible happens to you and there's like an exile part who is 
sort of holding all the pain of that thing that happened to you. And it's kind of like stuck in the past. It's like stuck in that moment. And then more parts get spun up. There are these protector parts whose job it is to protect you from ever experiencing the pain of those experiences ever again. And so it won't, so one way you could say, say it is that like, uh, and usually these experiences, it, my, my experience of myself and others has been at least for the people that I attract, like these are mostly interpersonal. Like I'm not talking about a bomb went off. I'm talking about like your parents were mean to you or like your teachers were mean to you or like very, you know, mean is of course a weak term for what, like, like, you know, various kinds of interpersonal terribleness. So one way you could mm -hmm. say it is that like uh, force gets used against you as a child in a bunch of ways. Like being a child in the modern world is just the, being forced to do a bunch of things all the time. And that use of force sort of generates parts. And in extreme cases, it can generate parts like an inner critic, that it's like sort of an internalization of all of these forces. Like there are all of these adults making you do stuff. And then eventually there's this inner critic that's kind of like an internalization of all of those forces that are like, now you're making yourself do stuff. And that sucks. It just like sucks to be in that position. Like it sucks that there are so many people walking around with like, you know, what's the, there's this term that some people use on Twitter that are really like cops inside your head. It's like, yeah, people are walking <laughs> yeah, around with cop, cops cop inside brain. Their head. It's like fucking terrible. And yeah. it's hard to like, just chill and go with the flow. And there's a part of you that is like about not doing that, <laughs> you know? There's mm -hmm. a part of you that's like, no, we can't do that. We have to police ourselves. Like we have to be good and careful. So like, I think, I guess one way of saying it is there are these like pits that you can find yourself in for a variety of reasons, like because of trauma, because of abuse. I mean, those are all sort of interrelated. Um, and you might need to have to do really weird stuff to get yourself out of those pits. That's like been very much my experience anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this thing that Mark Lippman says about meditation that I really like. He says, you know, some people think meditation is like you're training a muscle or something. I don't think it's like that at all. He says meditation is more like you're trying to solve a puzzle. Like there's this puzzle of you. There's like the way that you are kind of set up and sort of the, the way that you've had to be configured in order to survive as a person. And then meditation is sort of the open-ended puzzle of like kind of decomposing that thing and recomposing it into something better and sort of more elegant and like more, more or like more clean or like more natural in some way. And so I guess, uh, the i guess where i'm headed with this train of thought is that like non-doing is like a it's a direction to go in and it's a direction worth going in and like there may be some important sense in which sort of the end state of like personal transformation in a broad sense is to be like in a state of non-doing most of the time and in order to get there you might have to do a bunch of stuff <laughs> you might have to like sit down and decide on purpose like i'm going to use this technique now i'm going to like use this introspection technique i'm going to like do this physical exercise for, for five minutes like and you're doing all of that in order to like reconfigure your system or something and eventually it all leads to maybe like making it easier and easier to non-do and maybe along the way maybe you can do it mostly through non-doing like i don't i think there's there seems to be a lot of different approaches that people take right like the uh like the at the monastery the tradition is in some sense very much about doing it's very much like okay we are going to sit here we're going to get on to the cushion and then we're going to breathe and that's we're just going to do it that's like very much doing in some sense like you're just going to breathe and when stuff comes up you're going to breathe and when you don't feel like breathing you're going to breathe you know like that's like a very doing approach and supposedly it all ends in enlightenment which is i among other things i think supposed to be more of a non-doing kind of space but the way that they choose to get there in zen is explicitly doing and there do seem to there does seem to just be like a, ver, a difference of of technique here like there's just techniques that involve a lot of doing and techniques that involve less doing and maybe the thing to do is just try them all out and then kind of like see what fits and then sort of engage in this open-ended process of, of like meta doing, I don't know. Mm. Those are some, that's, so that's a ramble about that topic. Mm. Okay. There's, there's a, an active chat 
Can you see the chat? Uh, the chat room, by the way. Can you see? Uh, There's some interesting yeah. stuff happening here. Oh, boom. Um, yeah, I kind of want to go back to Sarah had a comment about second gut a while ago that I like. She's she's saying second gut equals emotional exometabolism, like emotional digestion metabolism outside yourself. Mm. That's interesting. Exometabolism. Yeah. So what is that? The, what does that elicit for you? So the the first thought I had was basically other people like interpersonal practice as the second gut you know like yeah you get on you get on twitter and you're like hey guys here's the stuff that i'm worried that i'm like wondering about and like do you want to give me some advice and then people just bombard you with advice you're like oh okay great and you can you know you can use twitter as a sec as more of a second brain as like hey guys what are your thoughts about like this topic like i'm trying to learn about statistics what are your thoughts about statistics and you can use twitter as a second gut you can be like hey guys how do you feel about dicks and then people can like <laughs> tell you how they feel about stuff and then you can sort of integrate try to integrate all those feelings in some way like i think there's a lot of i think i feel like i i do this sometimes like i'm trying i sometimes i i ask questions where i'm trying to like probe the communal gut in some sense mm -hmm. more do than you, i'm trying to do, do you feel like or, or at times do you feel like you have a troubled relationship with twitter or does it feel like like this is a, a always a worthy way to be spending my time and I'm always using it well. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I think the, wor I, the worst that I feel on Twitter is when it, f it feels just empty. Like mm. I, have a, I have a sense of sort of how much activity there's happening on my feed at any given time. And when there's like a lot of activity and I'm like having nice conversations with people and then it just feels great. I'm like, yeah, I'm hanging out with my friends. This is awesome. And then sometimes it feels like everyone's gone. And I'm like, where'd my friends go? And then I get all sad. And that's pretty much the only time I feel bad on Twitter. <laughs> when your friends are gone. Yeah, it's when I feel lonely. That's about it. You know, uh -huh. I have like a maybe an anxious attachment to Twitter a little bit. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, interesting. I yeah, just... one of the one of the the themes that that I wanted to bring up was like um, how to create something exceptional when we're all addicts. Mm. Addicts and to Twitter, you mean? Yeah, well, well, people are addicted to all sorts of things, but uh, yeah, yeah. but I'm finding my, I, you know, I'm just finding like the the attention that I'm putting on Twitter or the way that I'm using it is not as like it's not always as as smart or as um uh like it's it's a t it can be such a time suck sometimes, mm -hmm. um and uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking about that 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 second gut thing and in relation to how to use Twitter. Um, because yeah, maybe it's just like being able to establish some sort of pr orienting practice when you notice that maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, but when I notice that I'm like, um, yeah, I'm falling into a place where I'm not uh, like the, the algorithm has, has got me, Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. the, the team of psychologists who have hacked my attention <laughs> are successful, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know, just like some kind of orienting practice to like pop, like pop out of that. And uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, um, and maybe other people can help with that too. I don't know. Yeah. I like that question. So a lot, I, I also, I have a, a lot coming up in response to it, which again, it's just, I, I guess I'll just pick one and we'll see where it goes. Um, one thing for me about, addictions and addictedness is it's consistently the case that I'm more kind of stuck in my addictions when my life is going worse. Generally, this was mm -hmm. very true in grad school and my life was just awful and I was addicted to everything. I just like was on Facebook and then I was on like stack exchange and answering math questions. And then I was playing video games and then I was like reading manga and watching anime. And I was so, so, so stuck in all those things. And this is also something I've tweeted about, like there was a time when my life got drastically, I just like started feeling better about everything. And when that happened, I stopped wanting to do any of those other things. Like I just, there was these, there were these terrible feelings I was trying to escape from. And then when I no longer wanted to escape from them, I didn't have to do any of my escape things anymore. So that was mm -hmm. awesome. And I'm actually still finding that that's like, I can still use that as like a barometer of where I'm at emotionally. Like if I'm, if I'm, like if I find myself like spending a week, you know, watching anime or something, I'm like, okay, something, 
something's some, I'm avoiding something <laughs> like something's going on and I'm avoiding it. So mm. I have, I have like uh, what the rationalist would call it, maybe a tap, like a trigger action pattern of like, if I notice myself sort of getting stuck in addictions too much, I'm like, okay, what's, what am I avoiding? Like what's, what's like the terrible thing that I'm not, I'm trying to avoid having feelings about. And usually it's not that hard to tell, you know, usually I'm like, ah, it's that thing. All right. Time to go process now. And then I'll just be like, I feel sad. Oh, I feel angry. Oh, you know, and then I start processing about the thing and ideally I cry about it and then I feel better and then everything's fine. That's gotten harder, but uh, mm. that's, that's sort of the ideal case. I've also found that Twitter is like my most, like Twitter feels like the, it's like the best addiction I've ever had or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it's, it's easy for me now to be like, well, you know, reading manga and stuff is like not that good. Like, it's just, it doesn't really go anywhere, but Twitter, it feels like goes places, you know, I like mm -hmm. make friends and I influence people and I have interesting conversations like things. Twitter has stakes in a way that none of my other addictions really did, except for maybe mm -hmm. Sag Exchange. And so it's more addictive for that reason, like precisely because there are more real stakes. It's like a much more fun game to play. Um, mm. And it also feels harder to give up because of the real, I'm like, oh, you know, if I, I could ban myself from Twitter for a day, which I have to, you know, to try to do stuff and it's good. And I'm like, oh, but I missed out on a whole day. Like my, you know, now I had, then I have FOMO about it. Mm. And it reminds me of these stories of like, you know, when people, people would like play world of warcraft and they would describe getting into to, to it and the addiction would be like oh i'm like in a guild and i like raid with my buddies and if i stopped playing then my buddies would be disappointed in me like they need me to be the tank or the healer or whatever and i would be like letting mm -hmm. down my friends and when i first i this was maybe five or ten years ago i don't know when i first came across this idea i was like holy crap this is like a whole new level of like like taking advantage of people's social intuitions in order to addict them to a game is like brutal and this is of course social media is like extra extra this and i think there's a flip side of like the part of twitter that we hang out in is like unusually good i think long this yeah. axis most totally. people are just getting into fights all the time on twitter and meanwhile we're like oh my god i love you so much <laughs> wait can you think of a tweet that can you think of a tweet that like broke the fourth wall that and like suddenly people were interacting with you from other parts of twitter that weren't familiar like with your vibe or aesthetic yeah, That's, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, it's very alarming. It's terrible. I wish. Can you think? Do, do you know a tweet off the top of your head that did that? Yeah. So I I wrote this tweet about how basically I thought mathematicians were mostly useless, and I got a bunch of mathematicians <laughs> really angry. Oh my which god! I guess yes. Predictable, but they were just like, yeah, they were just like very triggered, and I was just like, well, I guess we're not going to have a productive conversation about this, and then we did not have a productive conversation about it. Hmm. I tried a couple times. Yeah, mine was, um, <clears throat> I had one where I was basically, I was like trying to, uh, trying to like prototype my ideal living situation. And I was like, okay, I want to live with like a group of brothers. And we have, oh, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like we have like really strong bonds. Like it's kind of like a secular monastery. Like, mm. we, you know, maybe we're working on a common project together. And then, uh, like maybe we have girlfriends and maybe the girlfriends live with each other. Um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I had all these like trad people just like fucking knocking on my door. And a lot of people <laughs> yeah. just, a lot of people just assuming that I was, um, uh, in that I was like lobbying for polyamory too. And I didn't oh. really say anything about polyamory, but it, but it's interesting. There were like, I think certain words that, that trigger that, that yeah. spinning, that mm -hmm. some people have yeah yeah it was fascinating yeah i remember that thread that was interesting i wish yeah some people were really mad at you i was shocked i just i just thought it was cool i was like this seems like a cool idea <laughs> and people were like yeah. you're a fucking you're everything that's wrong with modern society yeah <laughs> you're you're gonna destroy western culture <laughs> i was like it, i was like it's just me and a few friends like this has nothing to do with western culture like i don't know it's funny yeah triggers man Mm. okay yeah, let's, let's look no oh, sorry go ahead oh, so to backtrack slightly like the it's it's lovely that this part of twitter is so like loving and sweet and the flip side is that it makes it more addictive and i i'm like a little bit conflicted about this i'm like i think this is mostly fine 
And like this gets into, I guess, a broader thing that's on my mind around like, and I guess on everyone's mind now, since we're all stuck at home about like online relationships in the broad sense, not just romantic relationships. Like what, to what extent are there like things that you can't, are there kinds of intimacy that you can't really cultivate online? Uh, like this is a really live question for me. I think like I, there are people who are like, so an obvious example is touch, right? Like there's like things that can happen mm -hmm. through touch that just can't really happen any other way. And it sucks that, you know, you can get really close to someone in some sense through like texting and like chatting and like video calls. And there's still just like, like you can't touch them though. And there's like kinds of things, there's kinds of like information that you can't communicate unless you do that. Mm -hmm. So that's like a very obvious example. But I think there are subtler examples. There's like, there's even just like kinds of sort of vibing that I think you can really only do when you feel other people's physical presence in the same room. And there's this kind of frustrating insubstantialness to like a video call, for example, like we're sort of in the same room right now. And in many ways yeah. we're not. And like, I'm just holding a rectangle. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, did you, I think I missed a word. Did you say there's kinds of vibing that you can't do unless yeah. you're in person? Vibing. vibing. Okay. Yeah. Vibing. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think people even now, like, drastically underestimate just what they pick up from each other. And I think a lot of that stuff you, like, can't really pick up even on a video call. Like, there's just all sorts of, like, subtle, like, there's so many channels through which information could be flowing. There's, like, how people smell. There's, like, how their presence in a room, like, affects the air currents. Like, there's all sorts of crazy mm -hmm. subtle channels and it's hard to tell that they're missing also it's like because it's i think a lot of that information like gets processed at levels potentially far below conscious awareness and uh so it's like hard to tell that there isn't something there but all the but you, you may be able to like if you look for it find this sense of like like something in you hasn't been fully fed like i can have a great mm -hmm. conversation with someone over video chat i am quite capable of this and then the video chat is over. And if I really pay attention to my experience of that moment when the video chat ends, I'm like, ah, oh, unsatisfied. It just was, mm -hmm. oh, it's just, oh, like I could like, oh, mm, oh there's just. Ugh, ugh, totally. <laughs> yeah. 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 So th this is, this question is very alive for me too now because um, so I'm experimenting with this new project that I'm calling Zion Movement Collective. Yeah. And I'm basically just trying to, pull in a bunch of different people that have experience with um various embodiment and movement practices yeah and it's a digital incubator so regardless of what the exercise is you're never gonna get to touch another person <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what oh, like so yeah. so i just feel like that ha it's like yes um i feel like it's an important uh avenue to pursue because you you're still going to be able to interact with your own system. Mm -hmm. You're still going to be able to touch yourself. Information will be transmitted mm -hmm. through the digital sphere, but, yeah. but there is a, um, but there's going to be a lot of information that's left on the table mm -hmm. that um, hope, hopefully this builds up and people have enough like embodiment blue balls that we can throw some, <laughs> in, we can throw some like in-person events <laughs> when quarantine is done. <laughs> <laughs> great phrase though i love it yeah like I, I thought about that too like there is there's a way in which you know even before this i was like pretty gung-ho about like yeah in person is important embodiment is important i wasn't talking about it a lot like movement is important touch is important but now it's really obvious to a lot of people they're just like oh i am starving for touch i just want to touch everybody you know like it's mm -hmm. i think it's super obvious now to a lot of people experientially in maybe a way that it wasn't before which is good kind of it's like good that people know this about themselves they're just like oh my god yeah i'm like a person who needs other people to be around i just need it so badly like oh my god <laughs> like it's great to know that about yourself and it's great that people are finding out this about themselves like in at scale Mm -hmm. so yeah embodiment blue balls for sure <laughs> that's, that's great that's a great phrase yeah let's see i'm looking at the chat oh man i don't know how to display the chat and the video at the same time 
I haven't quite figured out the art of like I've done a few live streams and I haven't quite figured out the art of like paying attention to the person who's speaking to me while taking them because people will, you know, comment on something that is live in sort of in the conversation. And I don't want to interrupt you to like address the question, but then it gets to a point where, where we move on past that context and it's difficult to like go back to a question and pull it back. I don't know. There's, there's an art to it. I'm sure. Yeah. But you can just ask now, like if, if anybody who's watching has any, has any questions now, I'll watch the chat and see them come in and then we can, we can grab the question. So if you have a question now, please, please ask. Well, there's a, there's a question right here at the bottom of the chat. Oh, what is it? Curious. Lots of love, hate reference to rationalism. Curious where you guys are on with respect to rationalism these days. I could feel that. Yeah, go for it. Oh yeah, chatting is weird. Yeah, <laughs> so rationalism. That all that word always strikes me as very weird. I only I I only ever say rationality, but I guess whatever, it's all the same. So yeah, so the rationalists, the rationality community, there's this whole uh you know, so on the one hand, there is still the rationality community, and I'm still, you know, friends with several of the people in it, and they're still doing their thing. And then meanwhile, you know, there's this whole, like, on Twitter, this, like, post-rationalist kind of meme, which people make fun of, and this, like, meta-rationalist kind of meme, which people are also making fun of now, of, like, I, I see it, my experience of this kind of thing has been, like, there's a certain kind of person, and I would include myself in this category, who's kind of like a refugee from rationality, who like sort of went through that whole thing and then at some point got very frustrated with it in one way or another and left and was like, okay, now I'm like not, I'm, I don't gonna, I'm not going to sit with those guys at lunch anymore. Mm. And like you could think of it, and there's like, there's many ways that one could try to talk about this kind of transition. It's like a kind of development. You could think of it as like a kind of developmental stage transition of going from kind of like, oh yes, obviously I will solve all of my problems by thinking about them to like, wait, maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> what if I mm. d- did something else? What if I had feelings or cried or danced about it instead or just followed my gut or like just didn't worry about it in the first place or like a million mm. other options. And that transition seems basically good to me. Like I do think there's, I continue to think there's something quite incomplete about like the sort of rationalist conception of how to do things. And one thing about my relationship to that whole area recently is that I just really appreciate the way they did a bunch of reasonable shit while the coronavirus stuff was ramping up. Like they were like, all right, let's collate the best information. Let's figure out what like the easiest things to do are. That's how I heard about copper tape as a thing to do and that's Mm. you know like people were people in the bay area were like experimenting with quarantine protocols i think two weeks before the official bay area lockdown and i think that was just very good for them to have done and i'm glad they did it and like them doing that could have saved a couple of lives i don't know you know like i'm i'm like actually quite grateful for this bunch of like hyper rational nerds who are like incessantly worrying about everything like it just was very good trait to have in this particular yeah. part of human history. So good job. Thanks everybody for being that way. It's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that that's interesting. So I I never like uh, I was never part of the rationalist community. My, my most of my early um, social networks were like theater mm-hmm. kids, like art artistic the, like singers, dancer types. Mm-hmm. Um so the feeling the feelings thing was like was like part of the job early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and but when I started to get into more online culture and and spending more time on Twitter, um, I was more gra- I more had more gravitated towards the the meta rationality people because uh, just because of the um, all, like all the psychedelics and spiritual <laughs> stuff I've yeah, been yeah. <laughs> I've been doing like mm-hmm. recently, mm-hmm. and the and I used to be really obsessed with um, de- developmental models. I'm less obsessed with them now and really agree with the the that sort of last point that you were making about um just like feeling grateful that there are people that orient in the world and see the world and prioritize things differently and maybe you're maybe you're a refugee from that way of orienting in the world um but i don't necessarily think it's like 
rationalism's a lower developmental level. Uh, like I'm just more like these like these people see the world differently and 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 I would rather be curious about their experience than putting them in some developmental hierarchy. Yeah, I'm I I try not to the, I also went through a period where I was pretty into developmental stage models mostly as a way to be smug <laughs> about stuff, you know. And <laughs> yeah. uh I also feel like I've I like care less about that now i'm just like yeah there's developmental stage models they might be useful or whatever and i guess you could if you wanted to say it in a more neutral way like there are just you could say that people just have different patterns in what they choose to pay attention to and prioritize paying attention to mm -hmm. and in, like i there's a kind of like nice kumbaya thing of like oh you know you'll pay attention to this and i'll pay, pay attention to this other thing and we'll like all work together to pay attention to like different parts of the elephant kind of a thing and like, there's a question of, there's questions about how that is supposed to work in practice, but at least in principle, it's, it's a nice picture. It's like, okay, this is a fine division of labor. It's like, okay, the ra the hardcore rationalists and the tech people can like worry really hard about the fine details of like exactly which, and I was, I myself was doing this. Like I was, the, the initial period of my freaking out about the virus was like freaking out in the way that the rationalists were freaking out. Like I was like, oh my God, how do we estimate how dangerous this is? How do we estimate how dangerous various activities are? And being frustrated that I didn't have enough time to do that. Like I, mm. uh, there was this phrase we were tossing around at the monastery, you know, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to the level of your training. And what I learned is that the, when I fall to the level of my training, I become a rationalist. Like I just have like a my secret rationalist heart that gets activated when I'm stressed out. And it's like, all right, how do I rational my way out of this? And it's fine. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think this is bad. I just, it was just a thing that I noticed about myself. Like, okay, I just, I, I apparently become a rationalist under stress. This explains a lot <laughs> about why I was so drawn to this community in the first place. And, uh, and I think there's more, you know, like I also was doing, was trying to do a lot of emotional processing while this was happening. And it was obviously like, every time I succeeded, like I calmed down, I just got less freaked out and was like, prioritizing better and like just thinking more clearly and stuff um and like i'm i'm still glad i don't know i i guess i have a lot of I, my my train of thought is fragmented slightly but i'm still glad that i went through the process of freaking out for a bit and like furiously trying mm -hmm. to gather information like i think there was something there was something good about it there was some kind of like like slamming the situation into my face often enough that I was like, no, fuck you. Like to myself, like this is actually happening. Fuck you. Like pay attention to this, you motherfucker to myself and to other people to some extent. Uh, but I'm just basically glad I did that. Like, I think I was a little more emotionally prepared for this situation than a lot of other people were just be because I had been doing that kind of thing so much. It's just like, okay. Like I've accepted that this is really happening. And then I got to sort of watch everyone else gradually also come to accept that this is really happening, which I think for many people it's like, is happening like right now like now you know the sort of the romantic charm of quarantine is wearing off like at scale i think and people are just like upset now and i think this is good i'm just like pretty happy that this is happening <laughs> like mm. i hope that now ish is the time when people start to really like when it really sinks in that like oh shit this is just gonna keep happening and maybe I should mm -hmm. actually try to figure out what's going on and like figure out who I can, or at least figure out who I can trust to like have be even trying sincerely to figure out what's going on as opposed to like, Oh, I'm just going to play video games all day and sort of wait until this all blows over. Cause like, I don't know. I don't know. Like who knows if that's going to happen, man. <laughs> like it's very unclear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it'd be interesting to see like a <clears throat> like a content cartographer, like someone charting the content that people have been creating over the course of quarantine <laughs> to see like <laughs> like to see how the aesthetics change, to see how the, the tone changes, like what what's in the like collective psyche that people are putting out there and how does it change yeah. over time? I mean I've been it'd be interesting. Seems like a job for Aaron Lewis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been doing a little of this informally on Twitter, but it's hard to, you know, it's it's affected so strongly by like the specifics of who I follow and who I've been unfollowing and who I've been muting. But it does feel to me like pretty recently there was a like 
yeah, there was just this transition of like the charm is worn off. Like it's not funny anymore. It's like less funny now, at least. There used to be more jokes, you know, mm-hmm. like three weeks ago or whatever, there were like more like, oh, look at this funny joke, day eight of quarantine, and I'm like wearing a bathrobe or whatever. Like that that used to once upon a time that was the tone. And now the tone of the, <laughs> the, the tone of the like viral tweets that I'm seeing are much less like that and much more like eat the rich and like <laughs> Uh, you know, just the people getting very mm-hmm. mad about politics and so forth, which I think is just reasonable. It's like, there's a lot to get mad about. It's fucking outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. So how do, how do you relate to, how do you relate to politics? Like both at a, both at an object level, but, but also maybe more of a meta level on Ooh. Twitter. Oh man, it's, it's been tricky. So I guess like I'll describe maybe a transition from like normal times to now like in normal times by which i mean as recently as december uh it was just like my i this this is of course a very obnoxious thing to say but my sense was that like basically all political discourse on twitter was just being captured by brain parasites and like i can elaborate on what i mean by brain parasites but just like this kind of toxoplasma thing that scott uh scott logs and scott logs talks about with like there's this there's some kind of you know, there's this kind of, there's some kind of meme and it like promotes outrage. And because the meme promotes outrage, people spread it where it promotes more outrage. And then over time, like whatever the, whatever the meme is and by meme, I mean things like, you know, Epstein didn't kill himself or whatever. Like the, Hmm. some, the, the thing can acquire its own kind of identity and like existence through just being very, very good at propagating through social media, which is terrible. And then like, you just get these kind of zombie people who are posting and they think they're just posting their opinions, but they're just kind of under the influence of these like extremely outrage inducing memes that they kind of like are in some sense helpless to resist. And this is like a, this is like not a fun thing to say. This is like a dehumanizing way of thinking about people, but also it was, I mean, this was just in fact the way I was thinking about it. And like, mostly I was trying to stay out of that game as hard as possible because I did not want to be infected by brain parasites. Uh, mm-hmm. And I just thought there were better things to do with my time. I was like, these, like, I would just much rather help people cry and maybe together we can build a brighter future instead of like through worrying about politics. It, there's, there's also, to say it in like a, a, a less dehumanizing way, there's a lot of ways in which people just have shitty, terrible lives and have a lot of feelings about those lives and then project those feelings onto politics. And I wish I had a more concise way of describing that. It feels like there should be a word for that thing. And I'm not aware of a word for that thing, um, except for just projection in general. Like, mm-hmm. And I always, in that situation, I'm just like, man, I think if you cried, you would probably care less about politics. <laughs> like if you just had a nice cry about what was actually going mm. like and crying is stands for a, a long list of things like maybe instead of crying someone needs to take ayahuasca or whatever but like i think the vast majority of people who are like extremely concerned about politics in like a normal world would be better off just like working through their feelings about their life i think so that was in a normal world mm-hmm. and now we're in a very abnormal world and uh I'm, I've been like forced to think more about things I Warren's wasn't thinking about in December. Like I'm thinking about, I've been thinking a little more about politics in a broad sense. I've been thinking more about economics in a broad sense and about like supply chains, you know, it's all these things that I like would rather not have to think about. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And I guess my current orientation. Well, there, there is. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so Keep I guess going. my current orientation towards politics is something like Yeah, do I even still do I have any current object level opinions about politics? Uh, I guess to the extent that I currently am having object level opinions about politics, it's wondering about like so I have I know people on Twitter who are doing things like I know one person on Twitter who is doing things like calling the govern calling like mayors and governors and stuff and being like hey you should be doing x that you're not currently doing uh in response to the pandemic or whatever that that level of like local political 
I guess, activism in a small way seems like it could be unusually high leverage now compared to normal times. Maybe it's always high leverage, but now it feels now it feels real to me that it's high leverage. Like, oh, like a person that I know could like talk to a politician and maybe get them to change their behavior a little bit. So that seems good. And then on the other hand, there's this whole like, there's an interesting opportunity, it seems right now for people to just like broadcast like, hey, everyone whose jobs it was to protect you has been not doing that. Like everyone who was supposed to be keeping you safe and like making sure that things were okay has been just fucking around and doing dumb shit. And I've been reading a lot of articles like this and they all seem pretty on point to me basically like ways in which the who and the cdc and the federal government and the fda and etc have all just been like dropping the ball just repeat a lot just very very badly and like i'm i'm kind of excited about the current moment as an opportunity to just i'm not really sure how to say this like just have people just like keep pointing this out just like hey yeah like these none of these none of these things were trustworthy. Like these institutions were not trustworthy. They don't deserve your trust. They never deserve your trust. And like, it seems to me that there's opportunity sort of freed up to do something else to be like, okay, so now that we know that we can't rely on these motherfuckers, like what can we rely on? So there's some kind of like, there seem, seems to me that there's some kind of, there's like, there's energy available to be redirected in a way that I don't normally feel like there is. And I hope that we can like, figure out sensible things to do with that energy. Like I know people who are doing, I know people are doing things like forming mutual aid networks and like thinking a lot about sustainable agriculture and things like that. Like I was just reading this uh, essay by Benita Roy, who was like, yeah, we should just have a better economy that isn't like full of parasites. And then it would just work better. And we should just start trying to make that happen. And I was like, whoa, this is great. This is like a very cool vision for the future. So like, I guess, Okay, so I guess one way to say, to summarize what I just said is like, politics has become less separable from everything else. Now it's like more tied up with the political situation is like, at least feels to me like more tied up with the economic situation and with the like sort of culture war situation. And in all of those spheres, there's like a lot of people fucking up very badly and an opportunity to be like, hey, everyone's fucking up very badly. What if we did something that was better and you know, it's like a scary and exciting time. It's scary because I, I just don't know how bad things can get from here and exciting because like something new could happen and maybe it will be, maybe to get there, we'll have to mess up a lot and like maybe some terrible shit's going to happen along the way. And But I'll, you know, I, 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 I still feel drawn to this sort of more utopian kind of like, maybe this is a time that people can like, collectively get their shit together and like realize that the stuff they were worried about five months ago was stupid and didn't matter and that they can worry about better stuff i don't know i'm rambling at this point mm. yeah no no it's good i i i like the um and I, I feel like uh cultivating your intuition it helps you figure out what your part is to yeah. play mm -hmm. you know because because there, there are going to be so many different roles that are necessary um and I think one failure mode uh, of this moment is like thinking that you should be doing a certain thing and then beating yourself up because you're not doing it. Yeah. 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 You know, mm -hmm. it's like, Oh man, I think I, I, like, I guess I should be doing this thing because people are telling me that I should be, or like I, I'm my sphere of influences or the things that I'm paying attention to are pointing me in a direction that doesn't feel great, but intellectually it makes sense mm. um yeah i don't know the, the, uh, there's something to like um i don't know why this that world world of warcraft example is coming up that, that idea of the mm. guild it's like find your yeah. guild like find it like find a group of people that have like very complementary skills and everyone's like the master of their domain yeah that sounds nice i would like that i would feel pretty I'd be pretty happy if someone just like contacted me on Twitter and was like, Hey, I'm starting a farm and I want to like, <laughs> I want to like invite some people onto my farm and we can like try to make a commune or some shit. I'd be like, okay, whatever, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> if I trusted them anyway. like that, 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 yeah. like, I already kind of wanted to do something like that. And now I more want, I even more 
want to do something like that. And probably it's a terrible, I, I don't know. It could of course fail dramatically, but like, I, I, I would love to be in a guild. Like I would love to just be like, yeah, all right. My job is to like be the emotions guy and someone else is going to take care of the guns and the food. <laughs> like that would be really great. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you can just get really fucking good at being the emotions yeah, guy. That'd be nice. That'd be really nice. Consider any anyone listening to this who's like gonna start a farm and buy some guns and food. Consider this my application <laughs> to be the emotions guy <laughs> in your commune. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I'll put in my application to be the movement guy. Go. Perfect, because that stuff's important, you know. Like, like I I watch The Walking Dead. I know what happens when when you get interpersonal conflict and you're trying to like fight the zombies and shit like that's that shit will tear your group apart you really need someone who can like this is my mm -hmm. advertisement for my services you need someone who can like calm people down and get people like you know actually sort of actually like cleared and synced up emotionally that's just actually very important for a group working together and it's like even it's like it's more and more important the higher the stakes are basically now the stakes are mm -hmm. higher here we are in this brave new world. Anyway, that's yep. my that's my pitch for myself. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I'm feeling pretty. I'm feeling pretty complete. Nice. I'm feeling like uh, my energy levels are dropping. I feel like we've covered some really good territory with this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've gone in some interesting places. Thanks for thanks for coming on and thanks for thanks for agreeing to have this conversation. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's we've been wanting to do a podcast for a while yeah months i'm glad we i'm glad we made it did it <laughs> yeah um is there anything any like sort of final parting thoughts or anything that you want to share before we go yeah i had one thought in relation to this like the thing you mentioned about like oh maybe you have a thought that like oh i think that this is a thing i should be doing versus listening to your gut about what you should be doing whatever that means and like there's something really rich there that I have not really wrapped my head around, around like, so I imagine many, many of the people watching have had this experience of like trying to understand what's going on in the world generally in this moment and just being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of information available. Like there's too much information you could spend. And I have spent hours every day just reading like, news articles and then opinions and then statistics then like there's just so much information and like <clears throat> there's a way in which the cognitive part of the mind was like not really designed to deal with that raw quantity of information like there's there's a like you need to be able to prioritize what to pay attention to and prioritize how to pay attention to it and all this other stuff that's like very laborious to do explicitly and you could say that the the point of the other parts of your mind that are more like gut instincts or intuitions is precisely to do that for you like first you mm -hmm. inhale the information then you sort of let your system kind of sift through it and like bring up parts for you so that you don't have to do it consciously and explicitly because the conscious explicit part of you is like never intended to do that. Like there are mm -hmm. other parts of you that were, I'm at least moving towards a sense that there were other parts of you that are for sifting through vast quantities of information to like surface the parts that are relevant and important to you. And yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a practice of wanting to cultivate that capacity as opposed to like, a more rationalist kind of needing to think everything through explicitly and systematically. Uh, I wish I had more to say about this because it feels really important, but like the best I can, I can it does. Do sort of gesture vaguely in that direction that like maybe the thing that the gut broadly, I don't know. I don't actually know if it's the gut, like it may be literally the gut it may be the right hemisphere, but that maybe the thing that intuitions and instincts are for is this kind of sifting through complexity. Mm. Yeah. Re relevance realization. Yeah. Yeah, and in finding out what what information is relevant to you in any given because it'll it'll shift. So it's like being it lives beyond that lives beyond the thinking mind. Yeah. Yeah, there's something there about like being acutely sensitive to context and to mattering. Just like what is it that actually matters to pay attention to right now? Like you could you could decide to 
nerd out about and i had a someone pointed this out on twitter like a couple weeks ago and i was grateful that they like you could decide to like get really deep into virology and epidemiology if you want it like but is that necessarily relevant to like maybe you do that for a while and then you're like wait no this is not the thing that actually matters to me right now is like protecting my family and what i actually need to do mm. is just to, like find out some very concrete things about like what steps do I need to take to make sure that my like immunocompromised mother is safe? And like, that's a, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a question that will really focus your attention. There's like very specific things you want to know in order to answer that question. And most things are not relevant. And it's that kind of capacity to like surface relevance that is sort of, there's a way in which it's missing from the rationalist way of doing things like rationality by itself doesn't really give you a way to do that. Uh, it just kind of happens when you let it happen, when you like let sort of, uh, when you like let meaning naturally arise from a situation, then you're like, oh, this is the part I actually want to pay attention to. This is the part that actually matters to me. And I'm just going to ignore everything else for now because it's just not as important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. I feel like that's a good place to end it. Great. Thanks again, QC. Yeah, thanks. And thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Yeah. This, was, uh, this was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun. Oh, this is whole big. Does this chat get saved afterwards? Do you know? Or I think it... so. Okay. I think it'll just be on YouTube. Okay, great. That's fun. I'll enjoy reading through it. Cool. All right. Be well, everybody. Yeah. Stay I love safe. you all. Oh, that's sweet. All right.